Ladies and gentlemen, this evening I understand that the questions are going to be confined specifically to the area of art. And within that category, I understand that the questions are going to pretty much roam all over the map, which is okay with me. Shall we get started? Who'd like to begin with the first question? Thank you, Dr. Brandon. Do you consider objectivist aesthetics to be like objectivist psychology, an unfortunate formulation? Is aesthetics a science separate from philosophy? No, I don't think so. I don't think they're in the same category. I do consider, as I've said in print, the phraseology objectivist psychology a very unfortunate choice of words, as I explained in my introduction to the psychology of self-esteem. But aesthetics is a branch of philosophy. It is a legitimate branch of philosophy and is not an entirely separate science. The only qualification that I might add is that aesthetics, like ethics, is a branch of philosophy that in part necessarily draws on psychology. But there is such a thing as a philosophy properly having a very distinct theory of aesthetics. And therefore, I don't regard the object of aesthetics as a misnomer, but as a very valid description of a position within the total framework of the objectivist philosophical system. Yes? In objectivist aesthetics, art claims universality. What is it that gives art universality? Art is universal to the extent that it addresses itself to basic themes, questions, issues, values that in some way are relevant to the human race as such, or to human beings as such. Now, what would be the opposite of that? The recreation of some possible isolated episode that had no conceivable relevance in any of its aspects to anything but itself. There was no aspect of it that had pertinence to the problems of human life in general, or the choices that life confronts human beings with, or psychological issues that are perhaps pertinent to other human beings, art is universal in proportion as it taps in on an abstract level, so that when one encounters a work of art, one can hook into something that is not idiosyncratic to the artist or to a particular time and place, but has some wider relevance to human beings in general. And I think it's quite fair to say, and not particularly controversial, but that is true of virtually all art that qualifies by the name of art, whether any given individual may happen to like it or not. If it is truly art, there is some sense in which it is intended to be universal, but there are forms of art which succeed in that goal better than others, so that some art is universal or could claim to be universal only in a very technical, almost meaningless sense, only in the sense that it involves human beings and choices, but in no sense of any particular depth or specificity. And then there is art that illuminates basic conflicts, problems, issues, or values that are recognizably part of what man as a human being encounters in the universe. And then we talk about something that is more clearly deserving of the name universal. What do you think the function of an art critic should be? What do I think is the function of an art critic? I think that the first function of an art critic is to identify what the work of art is, to announce that it exists, and to say what it is. Let's take an art critic who reviews, oh, let's say novels, because that's the easiest. But the same principle would apply to paintings or music. OK, a novel has been written. What category of novel? What kind of novel? What is the author attempting to do? To what extent do you, the art critic, thinks he succeeds? What are the criteria by which we judge whether a novel succeeds or fails, in terms of style, plot characterization, and so forth? An art critic shouldn't be primarily concerned 
with the philosophical content of the work of art, he may include some mention of this, but if he's judging the work of art as a work of art, then to what extent is it a good representative of the kind of thing that it is as an artwork? And what are his reasons? He has to give enough reasons. He can't give an exhaustive analysis, but enough reasons so that his judgments have some sound of conviction to them. This is how I would understand the function of a critic. And one of the problems with many critics today is that they make of the opportunity to review some work of art a jumping off point for an airing of their own feelings about the universe such that it's possible to read entire book reviews and learn almost nothing about what is the book or what is the book saying, you see. And that's very frustrating. I think the first job is to communicate what is this object and to try to indicate what it's communicating in very essential terms, naturally. If the medium through which a work of art works is important, do you think it's really possible to translate a literary work or print a painting without losing some of the original, since the medium has been changed? No, I don't think it's possible, and I don't think anyone would disagree with that. For example, if you translate a work of literature from one language to another, in proportion as it's good, you lose something in the translation. Only if the work was terribly mediocre, really undistinguished, might you not lose anything in the translation, but in proportion as the author knew how to use the language in which the book was written, was sensitive to that language, to the richness, to the potentialities of the language, why then you would lose in the translation. And of course, the same thing applies to a painting. Now, conceivably, it might be possible in the case of painting, with some incredible technology in the future, to reproduce a painting that would be absolutely indistinguishable from an original. Meaning, I consider that a technological possibility. But we don't have that now. And so long as we don't have it, why then we are losing something in the translation. This again applies when we adapt, for example, a novel for the screen. In proportion as it was a good novel, it's going to be, I think, almost inevitably, rather a disappointment as a movie. Now, occasionally, you will see a story that was a better movie than it was a novel, which only suggests to me that perhaps it should have been a movie in the first place, that it wasn't a very good novel. But I've never seen a novel that really was an important major work translated to the screen where it wasn't a disappointment, especially to those who really loved the book. How would you identify the quality which seems to be lost when explicit sexuality is introduced into art? Well, I'm not certain that I understand what you mean, so I will assume I know what you might mean in answer to that. In certain senses, I don't think that anything is lost if explicit sexuality is introduced into art. It depends what is meant. I think that sometimes sex can be introduced into art that gets very explicit and is very artistic and very enhancing of the total product. Some writers, however, get explicit in a way that is harmful to the total artistic product for one of two reasons. One reason is that, for example, a painting could give you, let us say, the human genitals in such detail that the raw fact of sex becomes so overpowering that it tends to obliterate the emotional meaning of the rest of the picture because the pure aspect of the physical sex has such impact that it cannot be a harmonious part of the total. It totally demolishes the total because of the normal, predictable way a human being will react at a certain level of detail and specificity to, let us say, recreation of the genitalia. Okay. But another reason why, and maybe there the word explicit that you used is very important, 